and good evening. My name is Kay, for those of you that don't know me. And I feel like the Lord had given me a word. I knew what he wanted me to talk about, and I had started gathering scripture. And I couldn't seem to get past that point of the gathering scripture. Um, I knew what he wanted me to research, and his confirmation kept one after the other. Brian would say something on a Sunday or a Wednesday, or maybe both. Um, I would read a devotional that was about what the Lord put on my heart. Uh, Facebook would have a post about the same subject. Um, but I just couldn't seem to get motivated. I couldn't figure out how I was going to tie what he was telling me all together. So then one day, I was out in my garden, and I was pruning my tomato plant. And I'm clipping off the, the yellowing leaves, and I started saying in my garden, you're fruitless, and you are fruitless, and you are fruitless, and so on, and so on. And while I was out there, I heard John 15, 5. I am the vine, and you are the branches. And it goes on to say, if you remain in me, and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And I'm very familiar with that scripture, as I'm sure most of you all are as well, and I guess I just never really visualized it. But here I am, cutting off the dying, unfruitful leaves, removing every one that was not bearing fruit, paying specific attention to the branches that were producing tomatoes so that the nutrients would go to the fruit and not to the leaves that were providing no benefit but were still using the resources. I toss the leaves aside, knowing full well they are going to continue to deteriorate. John 15, 6, if anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. Now visually, I can see how the leaves I have just cut off are going to die, disconnected from their source. Unattached to Jesus, we wither. Now, I know this isn't groundbreaking news to many of you, and it certainly wasn't news to me, but this visual really gave me, really spoke to me, um, especially given the message I felt he had placed on my heart. Who or what is our source? And how do we stay connected to that source? This brought me full circle to what I feel I was led to research and share, the word. My prayer is that using scripture itself, uh, the importance of the word of God is revealed as well as the need to be in it daily. And that the spirit will move in each one of you to place a fire, a desire to know God more deeply and intimately. And I know everybody that does lessons does a little differently. What I typically tend to do is grab something, a subject, in this particular instance, the word, and then I like to go and see throughout the Bible where it says, what it says about the subject that I'm researching. So what is the word? John 1, verses 1 through 5. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. John points to the mystery of the triune God, with God and was God, one yet distinguishable. John also links his gospel to the creation account in Genesis 1. The word was, has always been, and is the creator of everything. Without him was not anything made that was made. So if you notice in that scripture, the word was given a personal pronoun, him. John 1, verse 14, the word became flesh and made his dwelling with us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Note again the use of the word his, yet another personal pronoun. So, from the study Bible, the word was a term used by theologians and philosophers, both Greeks and Jews, in many ways. In Hebrew, the word was an agent of creation, 
source of God's message to his people through the prophets and God's law, the standard of his holiness, and another expression of God. In Greek philosophy, the word was the principle of reason that governed the world, or a thought still in mind, embodying an idea or a concept. So to Jewish readers, to say the word was God was blasphemous. To Greek readers, to say the word became flesh was unthinkable. To John, however, this new understanding of the word was gospel the good news of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the eternal word of God, the ultimate revelation of the Father, the living picture of God's holiness, the one in who all things hold together. Sent to be a living example of who God is and what God expects. The Bible isn't just a collection of books. It is the living word of a living God. The Father loves us so much, he formed us in his own image, breathed life into us, and then gave us a divine user manual. 2 Timothy 3.16, this is what I told you Brian started stepping all in the word here. So that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Now, given where we are in God's timeline, um, as many of you know or believe, we are in the end of the church age. I think it's really, really important to know what doctrine is. Uh, Webster's Dictionary defines doctrine as, one, something taught, and two, a principle or body of principles presented by a specific field, system, or organization for acceptance or belief. And most religious institutions refer to that as their dogma. It's a system, it's a group of doctrines, um, a group of teachings that you believe in. Second Timothy chapter four, verses three. Now the spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Now I read that doctrine is teaching from God about God that directs us to the glory of God. And Holy Scripture is the source of that sound teaching. How can we know what sound doctrine is if we are not learning it? Matthew 24, 4, when asked about the end of the world, um, well, I lost my spot. Um, about the end of the world, Jesus warns, let no man deceive you. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. If Jesus is the word, and Jesus is the truth, then the Bible is the truth. How can we avoid being deceived if we don't know the truth? The Bible is God either speaking to us about his son, or talking to us through his son. I quote Chuck Missler, all the time, because the first time I heard this quote, I thought it was one of the coolest things that I've ever been brought to my attention. And it's that the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. And the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. So the Old Testament prophesied about Jesus, and the New Testament is Jesus fulfilling those prophecies. So as Acts 20, 27 mentions, we should consider the whole counsel of God. The Bible is all about Jesus because Jesus is the word made flesh. He is our source. How are we remaining attached to that life-giving source if we are not seeking him daily? The word is life-changing and dynamic as it works in us and through us. Not because God changes, but because we change. As we continue to mature spiritually, the word will, will reveal more and more. Just like a baby, we will move from milk to the meat. I mentioned the word is living. It is God breathed. Our spirit is refreshed with the breath of God each and every time we study and meditate on his word. 
A devotional from the Bible app said, as the word mixes with faith in our hearts, we are empowered to do God's will. It is relevant regardless of the phase of life or situation we find ourselves in. How many times have you all read a verse a hundred times and on the hundred and first time you get a new revelation? You know, it may be depend on what is going on in your life, your relationships, your walk with God, what you're praying about. God wants us to turn to him with all our concerns, questions, problems, celebrations, whether it be in parenting, marriage, school, work, whatever it is. Seek ye first the kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. That's Matthew 6, 33. If you're struggling to understand scripture, simply ask God for help understanding, and he will help you. I have found it pretty amazing when he has shown me when I've asked. Now, I frequently ask Siri, where in the Bible does it say, Bleh. I typically know the scripture, but I can't tell you the verse and or the, the chapter that it's in. And it's a great tool. And that was, I'll be honest, I was frustrated with some kids in the neighborhood, um, and I've been praying about it. And I wondered if the Bible had anything to say about it. Now I tell you, I cannot remember what I asked Siri, and I cannot make it duplicate the answer that came up to me for anything. But the following came up, and it's 2 Kings 2, 23 and 24. From there, Elisha went up to Bethel. As he was walking along the road, some youths came out of the city and mocked him. Go up, you bald head, they said. Go up, you bald head. And he turned back and looked at them and called down a curse in the name of the Lord. And there came forth two she-bears out of the woods and consumed 42 children of them. Okay, now that took a turn I was not expecting. And I'm going to the Bible looking for some, some resources about how to deal with these kids and 42 kids get eaten by bears. Now, I'm not saying the Lord led me to the scripture. But I do think it was timely, and it made me giggle. Not because that it was not a horrific scene, but um, it was just so unexpected. Um, and it also let me lay it at his feet. Obviously, the Lord was not going to harm these lovely little children on my behalf, nor was I cursing them. Um, but it did take away from that that he had control of the situation. He can and does resolve issues in ways we can't even imagine if we are in his will. Psalm 119, 105, um, and we did little lamps in a, uh, one of our little women's meetings, um, and this is the phrase that I put on my little lamp that we made. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The word guides us through the darkness. Jesus is our divine light, and the Bible is our divine compass. When we stray from the path he has set before us, as all of us do from time to time, he is always there to guide us back. But we have to be looking at the compass and following the instructions. Hebrews 4.12, the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of joints and marrow, and is the discerner of thoughts and intents of the heart. Now, soul and spirit are separate and distinct per scripture. The soul is described as our mind, our will, and our emotions. Christianity.com states the soul is the source of our expression through humanity. It has its limitations and the only way we can experience God is through our spirit. The soul is merely a channel. The spirit is at the core of our soul and is given to us the moment we are saved. And then we have joints and marrow. Now this one had me stumped for a while because most of us generally know that the marrow is what's on the inside of the bone that creates our red blood cells. It's an intricate, interlaced part of the bone. However, when I think of a joint, you know, I think of a bendy place. Um, you know, not think about breaking down a chicken. Yeah, you need a sharp knife, but it's not real terrible. So I didn't really understand that a whole lot. So uh, knowing me, I went to the Greek and Hebrew, which I didn't go. See, Linda's not even here to appreciate that I didn't go into so much Greek tonight. 
Um, that uh, they didn't help because the definition for joint was the same as it is in English. And then I came across an article on lightofword.org that had taken this verse back to Aramaic. The word for joint in Aramaic can also be translated membrane or covering. When studying a book on the human body, this researcher came across an illustration of the inside of a bone. The three parts of the inside of the bone are the marrow, surrounded by the actual bone cells where the blood, red blood vessels are, and then the outside membrane. Now this membrane is a very hard substance called a periosteum. These three things are fused together to form a bone. And the closest thing I could think of, of when I was doing this was the silver skin on a rack of ribs. If you've ever um, tried to remove it, and if you haven't, um, cooking point, take off that silver skin. It makes some fabulous juicy ribs. Um, I, I highly recommend you remove it. Um, but to separate it takes a really sharp knife. It's very thin. You've got to really get in there and separate it. But it's not a hard substance, and it is not fused to the bone. So that, these are the examples they're giving us of how sharp God's word is. You know, another commentary I read said it's the joints that connect bone to bone and give us form and that God's word is a powerful force that cuts through the false things that make us feel grounded or supported. God's word cuts through those errant foundational beliefs that have shaped us and held us captive. It discerns the good and the evil within us, what is from our soul and what is from our spirit. God's word reveals what we are and what we are not. It penetrates to the core of our moral and spiritual life. And I think the spirit is what the Father sees through the blood of Jesus um, in us. The word is one of two, wait, oh, I lost my, the blood of Jesus. Um, he can separate, so he's, I think that's just what he sees because he can separate our imparted righteousness from our humanness. And um, the word judges our hearts intense, um, judges our hearts and our intents. I mean, that's pretty specific. Knowing this, how could I possibly righteously judge another human being? Um, at, per Ephesians 6, 17, the sword of the spirit is the word of God. The word is one of two spiritual weapons we are given. The rest of the armor is defensive. The word of God is our weapon against the lies of the devil. If it was good enough for Jesus when being tempted by Satan, it is certainly sufficient for us. Jesus knew the word and quoted it back to Satan. If we don't know the word, how can we quote it back? John 14, 26, the spirit will guide us in all things and bring all things to your remembrance. If we don't know the word of God, how can we be reminded of something we never knew? The spirit needs a reservoir to draw from in, these, in times of need, stress, and growth. And this reservoir fills with the living water of the word. And that's what happened to me in my garden. He had me researching the word. And I'm in my garden, and he pulls out John 15. What? And then magically, through a verse I wasn't even thinking about, just through going through the normal course of my day, the Lord pulled everything he had been feeding to me to tie it together with the I am the vine and you are the branches. Psalm uh, 119.11, the word I have hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. If we are not studying God's word, how can we possibly hide it in our hearts? And we just talked about 2 Timothy 4.2. And I like the New Living Translation for this verse. Preach the word of God. Be prepared whether the time is favorable or not. Patiently correct, rebuke, and encourage your people with good teaching. How can we share the word of God if we do not know the word of God? How do we know what is good teaching if we are not seeking the Lord for understanding? Many of you have heard me quote uh, Charles Stanley. It's one of my favorite quotes, is that we are to emulate Christ in conduct, character, and conversation. 
to do this, we have to know who he is and how he lived. We must not only listen to the word, for as we know, faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. We've repeated this many times over the last several weeks. But we must let it shape our lives. James 1.22, do not merely listen to the word so you deceive yourselves. Do what it says. How can we apply the word of God to our lives, emulate Christ, do what it says, if we don't know what it says. And the beauty of this is, we don't do it alone. John 15, 26, But when the Comforter is come, who I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. So God gave us a guide, the ultimate guide, his Spirit. John 6, 35, Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will not thirst. To sustain ourselves physically, we must eat. To be sustained spiritually, we must eat. 1 Peter 2, 2 1 Corinthians 3, 2, and Hebrews 5, 12 through 14, all refer to the Bible as spiritual nourishment. And that's the milk versus meat that I mentioned a little earlier. Jesus, thereby the word, is the source of our spiritual nourishment. We do not live by bread alone, but by every, on every word that comes out of the mouth of God. He goes on to say, he is the bread that came down from heaven, uh, referring to the manna that sustained the Jews for 40 years in the wilderness. The manna, that by the way, the Jews did not like that either. Uh, the manna symbolized God's love and care for his people in spite of their sins. I mean, that 40 years was their punishment. And even in their punishment, God was feeding them. That is how much he loves us and how merciful and gracious he is. Uh, we are told to pray. Um, so we connect with Jesus and are fed every time we open the Bible and learn the word of God. We connect. Oh. We are told to pray, give us this day our daily bread. This is twofold. We are praying for physical and spiritual sustenance, food and Jesus. Two of my favorite things, I'll be quite honest. Um, we need to eat daily, so we should be com uh, communing with Jesus daily. This is how we remain attached to the vine, our source deepening our relationship by spending time with Jesus in his word every day. When I study scripture, I go down all kinds of rabbit holes. I love understanding what is happening historically at the time, what the people at that time believed, what their traditions, their rituals were, etc. Um, so I want to share when I was researching about biblical bread, um, I found this interesting little tidbit. So grain offerings in the Old Testament came after the animal sacrifice. Jesus, who's the ultimate flesh sacrifice, offered the bread offering the night before he was crucified. So he flipped it because he is the final sacrifice. There is no sacrifice after Jesus. He, he said it is finished and he sat down beside on the throne when he, when he got to heaven. So I hope the importance of reading the word is starting to sink in. I'm not saying you have to spend hours a day, not that that would be a bad thing, but if you are not reading some scripture each day, start with a devotional. In September, read a proverb every day. Uh, you'll have to double up a day to get all 31 in. But I've heard if you do that every month with proverbs, you'll have read proverbs 12 times. Some months you have to double up. Um, download a Bible app. There's all kinds of good ones out there, and you can you can connect with your friends um, and do Bible plans through there. Set a reminder on your phone. I don't care how you start, just start. I think it is vital that you get a Bible, a Bible, not a Bible. Electronic is nice. These versions are great, but deceptive times are here. And I can guarantee you modifications and manipulations to the Bible are high on the priority list. 
I've already seen several reports where China is currently rewriting the Bible. So if you don't have one of these that has it that they can't change unless they wrench it out of your hands, you might be in trouble if you don't have the Word of God to go to. Um, let's see what I'll say. Um, I did want to share some tips and tools I use when studying the Word. And then, like I said, I, I told you I'd get you out here early. I would love to hear your alls when you all study the Word, especially those that have done Bible lessons or do Sunday school, um, run little, you know, little Bible classes, what your trips, tips or tricks are, because I, I, it just makes all of us learn and, and grow in Christ. We've mentioned this, I think, maybe probably on Wednesday night. Many of us know the Bible will explain itself. If you don't understand a scripture, read above it, read below it. Typically, it will explain itself within there. Uh, another gem from Chuck Missler, love me some Chuck, never walk into the Bible with bare feet. Uh, pray before you study and be amazed at what God reveals to you. You know, I've mentioned I use the internet, but this is also going to take more and more discernment as time goes by. Again, you've got to be grounded in sound doctrine. Uh, two websites that I love, uh, blueletterbible.org and gotquestions.org are great websites I frequently use. Uh, blueletterbible.com, another nod to Chuck, uh, is what opened my eyes to Strong's Concordance, which is an index of every word in the King James Bible. Uh, each word is assigned a number, and the root meaning of the word is linked to the original meaning in Hebrew and Greek manuscripts. Thayer's Greek Lexicon, which is a comprehensive lexicon, lexical work of over 5,000 entries that are mapped to each Greek strong number in the New Testament. And I have both of those. Okay, here's Webster's. I love Webster's. <laughs> Just to, oh, I get one of these, too, because they're changing those definitions, too. I, who knows what a woman will be here in three years? Bears. I also have an interlinear Bible. This is amazing. This actually gives you the original Greek and the uh, original Hebrew. I would recommend a magnifier. Um, I did bring my strongest concordance too. So if you all just want to see just some of the tools that I use, I did bring them with me so you all could see what they are. Uh, I also like to read out of several different versions. Um, Brian taught me that. You know, sometimes King James, I just can't grasp my head around it. And I'll go to the New Living Translation or I'll go to the Amplified Version. You know, you'll hear a lot of people say that I'm King James only. Well, I think you kind of lose out if you don't. You know, if you have one, you're going to be able to tell if they vary too much from translation to translation. But a lot of times those other versions will really help you. And that blueletterbible.org will let you, I mean, it, I think it might even have the Geneva Bible. Like, it has so many options that you can go to. Um, Brian's a great tool. I use him all the time. Um, on more than one occasion, I've shot him a text asking for uh, help with a particular situation. Uh, most recently, um, I was asked him for help with somebody being in my lane. And ironically, he couldn't answer me because he was on the Bluegrass Parkway and knew all too well about people being in this lane. Uh, so God frequently speaks to me in humor, by the way. And in that time, it, I realized that really what I needed probably wasn't that important in that past time. But he did answer me back, but it was, it was rather humorous. Um, and then I want to end with a clip on Facebook I saw. I'm hoping that I can play it from my phone on to into the microphone, and I wanted to end with it because I didn't want to follow it. Um, it's a child, and he has gone through the Bible and reveals Jesus in every book of the Bible. Because as we said, Jesus is the Word. It is all about Him. Jesus Christ is the seed of the woman. In Exodus, He is the Passover lamb. In Leviticus, He is our Samuel, he is our trusted prophet. In Kings and Chronicles.
Jeff's died. You it died, yeah, it died about halfway through. Oh, I'm so <laughs> sorry. Well, and I think my microphone died. Is that what happened? Yeah. That's right. I thought it was, and I said, you all, know, I've, I've got it posted and I can share it. Um, that was just amazing. And it just, it really did make me cry. And it made me cry again. Uh, and to have a child, they are going to lead it. To have a child be so passionate about the Lord. That's what I want for us. That's what I want for people watching online um, to just have that desire.